Hello and welcome to The Flying Frisbee with me, Dominic Frisbee. And today we're going to talk about censorship. We're going to talk about P.G. Woodhouse and the violation of the great man. And with me to discuss uh, this issue is far-right extremist and fellow comedian, <laughs> Simon Evans. Hello, Simon. How are I'm you doing? I'm a comedian and fellow far-right extremist. Oh, you, you're bringing me into this now, are you? Very good. So now I... As you know, and as regular viewers will know, that we this um, they're editing, they're going back and they're editing some PG Woodhouse. Yeah. And when when a great pop star dies, you will often get this sort of competition on social media to be the person who loved that pop star the most. Mm. This sort of happens as the outpouring of grief. And I, if we were to get into a competition about who loves Woodhouse the most, I sort of think I would win. Not okay. between me and you necessarily, but me and, and the world generally. When I was sort of very depressed in my 20s, um, I just used to read him all the time. And he brought me so much joy and so much happiness. And all I wanted to be was a comic writer. And I, I think he's written something like 100 books. And I've read almost all of them. I've certainly wow. read a, a, all the ones that were in print. And I went as far as to actually take a Woodhouse novel and rewrite it sentence for sentence in my own words in order to understand better understand the technology the 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 technique behind his writing it was sort of that insane my worship of woodhouse at one point so i was very upset violated and all the rest of it to read that they're going back and rewriting some of his stuff but I think it's fair to say it's a bit more nuanced than that. It's not a sort of Orwellian rewriting of history, or is it? Well, I mean, you're right. It's fair to say that it's nuanced. I don't think anything in this world worth discussing you know, lacks nuance, certainly not when you've got a corpus of 95 books, as you say, and somebody who wrote most of them getting on for 100 years ago, probably centred around that kind of time frame, um, not quite as long ago as we perhaps imagine. He died in, I think, 1971 and was did, writing yeah. pretty much up to his death. So he's not... He's not like Conan Doyle or something, writing in an entire, just purely in the Edwardian era or something. He wrote into something approaching the modern era. His, but... his stuff feels like it's older because it was all yeah. set in that sort of pre-World War I Edwardian magical world when Britain was still great. But I would say his peak output years were probably 1930 to maybe 1965. Those were That was when his best books were written. Yeah, and interestingly, he um, he had to sort of uh, rebuild his reputation somewhat after the Second World War, where, of course, he made, um, again, a, an area for dispute. But I, I noticed that Christopher Hitchens gave him a pass, you know, and allowed that it was naivete rather than, uh, than, than ill will that had him essentially channeling Nazi propaganda yeah. from his... Um, what what but, actually happened there, just uh, in, in case you're not familiar with the story, this is this is not for you, it's more for the listeners and the, and the, and the viewers, is that he was in, he was living in France at the time of the outbreak of war in yeah. Le, Le Touquet and he was taken prisoner uh, by the German forces and he was put in... Um, House the, arrest, essentially, uh, wasn't it? No, it was more. He was actually put in, in, a, in a camp. In a, in, oh, it wasn't okay. a concentration camp, but it was a prison camp, right. but for civilians. Right. So he was reasonably well treated. And he actually liked it because it reminded him of boarding school. <laughs> he lost weight. He got fit. He did all those kind of things. And the regimented lifestyle, he was already used to that, having been to boarding school. But he wrote various missives uh, from, uh, the, 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 from the prison. But because he was trying to make light of his experiences and like don't worry about me I'm okay he made mm. jokes about it and basically he misread the room and these this the, the fact that he made light of his existence was seized on by German propaganda and so it was a colossal misunderstanding basically but it all derived from the fact that he was intending no harm, didn't want to be a victim, was making light of his experiences in prison. Which is pretty much how you could characterise, you know, his again, his entire output, really, making light of things and, and not treating life as too much of a burden. I mean, it is interesting what you say, that you treated him almost as a, a sort of palliative when, when you were depressed. There's a lot of people from across the political spectrum as well, interestingly, who have specifically said that at their darkest moments, Woodhouse was there for them in a way that texts they might otherwise regard as more important you know, in, in building their, their spiritual or intellectual development or whatever, just fall away. But Woodhouse just never fails to, um, to just elevate you somewhat and provide a bit of a cushion. Just, to, I mean, to come on to the specific case that, that was in I, question. Actually, 
I, I've just you just made me think of something. I first discovered Woodhouse. Like I was in a dormitory. I went to boarding school, and I was in a dormitory, and there were probably six of us in the dormitory, and there were two black guys in the dormitory with us, uh, twins uh, from Ghana, and it was them who discovered Woodhouse for me because they were reading Woodhouse and they were laughing at it and they were reading it out loud mm. and you know they were laughing at it so much and doing Bertie Wooster impressions and all the rest of it that that led me to discover Woodhouse so I actually discovered it from two Africans mm. and I say that because it's kind of relevant to to what you're about to talk about the 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 rewriting Woodhouse and 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 the across the spectrum appeal of him yeah um well, I mean, I guess it is, yeah. Uh, in fact, there have been uh, various articles shared over the last few days um, concerning his, his legacy and, and his reputation in different parts of the world. And one of those made the point that he has enjoyed an unbroken reputation since his death in India, where where there's a um, uh, a thriving society, uh, uh, you know, of, of Woodhouse aficionados who uh, regularly exchange emails, have meetings and so on, and, and discuss his finer points. And, uh, of course, there's no particular uh, sort of clash of ideology there. It's, it's not like Kipling. He wasn't, it's not, his work didn't sort of celebrate empire or colonialism mm -hmm. or, or treat Indians as second-class citizens. I mean, they're not overcoming any kind of obvious barrier there. But nevertheless, there is something that appeals across... The, there is something in his writing that I think particularly appeals to those who still cherish the English language and its capacity to entertain, to uh, to surprise, you know, his... His his boundless enthusiasm for creative metaphor and simile is is probably you know mm -hmm. the, the thing that's often held up as without equal in in comic literature. He was the master of the transferred epithet. Yeah, there you go. Very nice. But that sort of thing is often, um, I think, appreciated outside in the same way that you know they say there are no Londoners like a Port Stanley Londoner. You know that the the the, the, uh, the, the Falkland Islands uh, flag waving constituency because it still matters to them their british identity is not taken for granted and in the same way there are there's a particular keenness a fervor for those for whom english is a second language but one that they have mastered with pride that they enjoy that kind of prose in a mm -hmm. way that perhaps people who just take it for granted that everything that they read and that they're surrounded with, the, the water they swim in is, is English and, and it's it's all taken for very much as, as read. Yeah, comedy is the hardest thing to understand in a second language mm. because it just is. Yeah. And so when you if you start getting jokes in a second language, then you, then you, you know the you speak it well. That was the beginning of the end for Eddie Izzard, wasn't it, when he was determined that he would make it in French as yeah. well as in English. I was like, that's really setting yourself unnecessary barriers, you know, and the kind of almost slightly presumptuous implication that you have done, that you've gone as far as you're like Alexander weeping because there are no more worlds to conquer in, in mm -hmm. English stand-up. I'm like, you're good, but... <laughs> he likes odd to do odd things. But, but yeah, so let's come... Should we come back to the... The, the, the specifics in, in this yeah. case... To be clear, this is not something where a bunch of graduate um, sensitivity readers have read Woodhouse and decided that he really needs modernising. I want to be clear, this is not, in that sense, it's not, arguably, it's not the most um, uh, outrageous um, intrusion into, into a great body of work. It is the publisher's Penguin, but also the estate of P.G. Woodhouse, have noticed that there are a few uses of the N-word, specifically, mm -hmm. which now are much more jarring than Woodhouse himself would have intended. And that is probably true. The N-word has, for reasons we can discuss, become uh, like quite sui generis in its capacity mm. to offend and, and divide and, and inflame compared to other swear words or, or uh, you know, uh, all kinds of... There, there's yeah. nothing else in the language, really, essentially. It's that, taken that, that on has, a whole new life. Yeah. So... Um, they decided to whip it out because in 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 the original uh, it was simply used to denote a kind of minstrel entertainer. That's how yeah. Woodhouse meant it. It was he he was describing a uh, one of his characters adopting a pose that he might have expected to go with you know a a boater and a candy colored blazer and and and, and blackface. Yeah. And and that is because the word then was used in fact to denote a white man in blackface in his mm. in that context rather than uh, somebody of African origin. So okay. in a way it's also confusing in that regard. But anyway, the point is, yes, it I mean you c I can definitely see of all the reasons of all the possible justifications for tinkering with with the prose this this is surely the least harm you know this is just just wave it through yes why 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 would we bother but i just felt just to add a tiny bit of context to what you said he yeah. was a great he wrote lots of musical 
Woodhouse. Yeah. He wrote some musicals, he wrote the books for musicals, and he wrote a lot of musical, and he went there. Mm. And his characters are always referring, you know, they'll his characters will say a musical joke or there'll be some kind of reference to that yeah. to that world. Although interestingly, his musicals were never as successful as his books. No, he loved it, didn't he? The Broadway, um, yeah. the milieu, really. I mean, I think he was happier, bizarrely, as you say, being somebody who is almost the laureate of, of a certain kind of Englishness. I, I think by his own admission, he spent very many happy years living in America. He did. And he at one point, he was actually, he was employed by Hollywood on a retainer. So he lived yeah. in, in California for a long time. He called it Dottyville on Sea. <laughs> <laughs> of but, all the but great... He, but, and his never, stuff ever, never got made. His films never got made. So he was constantly writing stuff that would never be made. And yeah. while he was doing that, he carried on writing his books. Yeah, yeah. Well, so. as we you know, as we know, just one of those people for, for whom life only really made sense when he was behind a keyboard, you know, yeah. hammering it out, and he would do whatever it took to uh, just to keep the, 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 the groove greased. But... Um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think that metaphor fell into his lap probably because of his association or his familiarity mm. with the stage and the musical stage. I'm just going to ponder a question. I don't know the answer to this, mm. but I know the the blackface thing. Um, you know, it has its origins in the uh, interactions between the west of England and the north coast of Africa and the Barbary slave trade and all the war and interaction, everything else that went on. And Moorish dancing, Moorish dancing actually develops from Moorish dancing, as in uh, Othello, Othello the Moor and all that. Yeah. And so that's why you often see the blacking up thing in Morris dancing pageants and all that. And it was doesn't a sort look of pagan... terribly Moorish, does it, by no. the uh, standard <laughs> of my most familiarity? But yeah. So I wonder if the... But I wonder if the whole sort of culture of the minstrel in yeah. music hall derived from the fact that there just weren't that many black guys entertainers in Britain at the time to actually play the black guys. So yeah. white guys would, it was like, you know, masks and things. Is that is there some truth to that, do you think? Could you have any knowledge of well, that? Listen, I'm, I, I, like you, I'd be speculating, but I have always felt in a number of different scenarios and, and in particular regard, you know, to... Um, to uh, black white racism that we are at the moment in this point in history importing wholesale and without question a set of attitudes that were developed in the American South mainly and certainly the United States of America generally into a Britain which had an entirely different history and and experience and cultural integration with uh, the peoples of, of all the you know different parts yeah. of the world. Which but is we, not to we say... got rid of the whole minstrel thing in probably the late 70s was when the black and white minstrel show was ended. As a show, and yeah. And the demography of the UK obviously changed a lot in the 60s and 70s after post-Windrush with all the yeah. coming in. And, and maybe the with and white... the new demography, then it, then it suddenly seemed very inappropriate in a way that it didn't. With the previous oh sure, but the black and white minstrel show. I remember watching that with my grandparents. Yeah. That was clearly um, aping, not parodying, but I suppose celebrating or, or creating a sort of nostalgic glimpse back into an American culture. I okay. mean, they, it, they the absolutely old Al it was like, stuff. It was that. the uh, Camptown Races and so on. Yeah. Those were the songs they sang, you know, and, yeah. and they were on steamboats on the Mississippi and so on. I mean, they weren't, but they were creating those yeah. in cheap, shoddy, you know, stage sets. So you know, was, a bunch of pensioners in Germany, a bunch of old ladies yeah. who dress up as, as Egyptian women have just been told they can't dress up as Egyptians anymore because it's... Well, they had six outfits. And, they, I mean, I saw the photographs of them. They they were quite comically. It was like a sort of Amdram thing from, you know, Oxted or something. Uh, it was quite... I mean, it was, I thought, harmless enough. Yeah. Uh, they so, had sort of Gilbert and Sullivan versions of the Mikado, that sort of thing as well. OK. You know. So I guess... Here, in a way, cultural appreciation or cultural appropriation. There's a, maybe a bit of conflation between the two. Listen, I mean, we, we could go down all sorts of um, blind alleys with this. The, the, the simple fact is that there's a, one simple offensive word that has yeah, been okay. excised from a bit of prose in, in, in Woodhouse. And I'm not, to be absolutely honest with you, in, entirely interested in exactly what he meant by it at the time yeah. in terms of defending it. It's a point of principle. Do you begin to do this to text if a certain word has become absurdly offensive now? Or do you put in something in the preface? Do you put a sticker on the front? Do you say that there are words in this text which don't mean quite now what they might have meant then? Mm -hmm. Or do you start tinkering? And my, my issue is that as soon as you start tinkering, as soon as you've made the first incision, the thing is spoilt, you have opened the door, you've legitimised the process of retroactive improvement, and and it will become the mode in which texts are made 
more palatable for the young. We already know that there are Joseph Conrad books whose titles are problematic for children. Mm. Conrad, by many um, like serious experts' judgment, one of the two or three finest writers of English prose ever. Mm. Again, writing as a second language, yes. of course. Interesting. About to say that there are all sorts of um, problems in his text. There are problems course in Kipling now who's virtually disregarded despite having been the first English Nobel laureate I think certainly the youngest uh, at mm. that time I mean there are extraordinary parts of, of literature which are just kind of like being powered down essentially now mm. because they're um, we've joked you and I have before now about trigger warnings and so on and saying oh rolling your eyes you know you're, you've gone to university to study English literature do you really need to be warned that you know when you open up Chaucer, it might contain some attitudes to sex that were that might now strike you as problematic? But I would sooner that I would sooner have just a blanket warning. Anything published before like nineteen, my goodness, probably before two thousand and twelve, and the Great Awakening is is likely to you know <laughs> contain some challenging propositions. Yeah, BC now. should be before COVID. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen what is the film uh, about the bouncing bomb? And, or is it about Dan Douglas? Busters. Dan Busters. Yeah. Thank you. And you're and aware. Dog. And the dog. Yeah. And and I remember that probably twenty or thirty years ago. The the the, the N word, the name for the dog, being yeah. blanked out. Where do you stand on that? Oh, it was blanked out twenty or thirty years ago. Well, they beep ago. they beep it out. Yeah. And this was all. I think they just you just suddenly lose the sound when they say the name of the dog. Yeah, like a radio edit of an Eminem song. Probably something yeah. like that. <laughs> so it's come here, it's come here, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So that was. Um, and I'm pretty sure that wall? happened when I was Pink a teenager. Floyd used it in the wall, didn't they? He's watching uh, the Dam Busters in the segment where just before Comfortably Numb uh, comes in, where he's in his like hotel room waiting to go on stage, but before he takes his my, his his heroin or whatever it is to make him able to uh, cope with the loneliness of it all. The Dam Busters is a is one of the films that he uses, and there is that element in it which I think is used to um, sort of illustrate the disconnect because his father dies in the war. The the, the lead character in the yeah um, in the war. I I I wasn't aware of that, mm. so I don't know if it's still there. And I guess the BBC. I mean, I, the Dam Busters is kind of an okay film of its time, yeah. a great film if you like, in in to some people. But I guess it's not quite as great. As maybe Woodhouse is, yeah. So it's it's and the BBC probably just blanked it out just to save themselves a headache. I mean, it uh, is you're absolutely right. This it's like people have said, you know, um, you you struggle nowadays to find any any Gary Glitter on the shelves, but the 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 weight of evidence against Michael Jackson is still fairly heavy, and yet yeah. there, there's no attempt to remove or even to limit his radio play. Because because the the work is so great, you know, yeah. and that works in the. I mean, this is not exactly the same. Obviously, it's almost a reverse. But you do have to kind of weigh up and think. Well, just how important is this? Mm. The Dam Busters is very much a. I mean, it was not exactly. You, I wouldn't traduce it as propaganda, but certainly there was there was yeah. an. A, you know, it was of a time and a place, and it was serving a function. I wouldn't yeah. call it a work of art necessarily. No. I think there are, for instance, paintings by Goya, you could say, or even Velázquez, uh, in which there are depictions of what would have, the, or I don't know what word they might have said, but let's say the word might have been Negro, uh, and the physiognomy is traduced again to some extent, you know, and you would say but possibly made to appear um, simple-minded or something like yeah. that. And and that, again, is, you know, well, are you going to say take Goya down from the galleries? No, of course not. You, you, you take a deep breath and you go, this is a work of art which comes from a certain time and place. I think Hergé had a lot of accusations. Tintin had a yeah. lot of accusations against him. And his depictions uh, in, I think it's Tintin in the Congo, yeah. are... You know, not his greatest. Let's put it that way. Uh, well, uh, I, I think, mean, but I think Belgium, that has survived. Right? He was Belgian. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> has that survived, or is Tintin in the Congo? I never liked Tintin, so I'm not that bothered about it. And there's only there's a limit to how much you know. I'm not. I wouldn't yeah. set myself up as a PhD on this subject. I, I mean, a couple of people when I wrote that thing about Woodhouse said, "How did you feel about Dahl?" And then somebody else said, "How do you feel about the Reverend Audrey and the Thomas the Tank Engine books, which were changed apparently in order to remove some black as such and such okay. uh, similes?" And 
I had to say, in all honesty, I was never that fond of Dahl, but, you know, but I'm, I, I entirely defend the right of people who are fond of him to make their case that he should be left unadulterated. Yeah. And able. I always felt he was too eager to curry the favour of young people by um, insulting and, and defaming hardworking farmers, you know, <laughs> in their opposition to foxes. But, you know, I, I didn't read that stuff as a kid. It holds no particular um, place in my affections. And the Thomas the Tank Engine, I just think, is is like, I mean, in this day and age when when trains are if, if they arrive at all are the most faceless dismal kind of i cannot imagine how children are able to personalize them or or transpose their their imagination to those books i always found them yeah. utterly pointless and charmless i don't regard them as literature i do regard woodhouse as i said in the in the article as the bark of com- com- comic yeah. prose you know and That's you just don't tinker analogy. with it you just don't mess with it you know you just say i'm sorry if you want to read this be aware there might be the very, very slight... I mean, honestly, I'm sure anyone would skip over it. Anyone not capable of compartmentalising an unfortunate term like that while reading it, you know, who is not going to be able to enjoy the work anyway. Yeah, I mean, I've... I, I This is quite a profound subject, is the... the, the the, the what's the word the the status that this that the n word now enjoys mm. in the language maybe the status isn't the right word I'm you know I'm, but the so like it's it's almost gone too far so for example I, I'm seeing videos sometimes get shared with me on Twitter or whatever where you will see somebody have the crap kicked out of him like really bad like life endingly bad. Mm beaten out of him for being accused of using that word mm. so he 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 could potentially have been misheard or something mm. now is is it should we be keeping the past use of the word in to to almost to to offset I mean, the, the words almost become too powerful and, yeah. you know, it's it's fine when one group uses it, but another group, if you even say the word, you get the, shit, the crap kicked out of you. You know, what about the kind of life-ending violence, mm. just the use of one wrong word? Surely that's got out of proportion with each other. So maybe in a way it's good to just remind people that the word, mm. I mean, ultimately the word was a pejorative term uh, for black people in, in the United States. But for example in negro just means black you know it just does just just mean yeah, black yeah and and should in a way is there a case to keep the historical use of the word in so that people realize that the the overriding emotion that this word evokes in some ways has gone too far well, I mean, I, I, I suppose you've got to be realistic about what part a, a Woodhouse novel might have to play in that, which is fairly minimal. But I do, yeah. it's an interesting, it's a very interesting conversation. It is almost unique, I think, as you say. And um, there is always the danger that if you try and raise any objection to the status that it currently has, that we as grown adults on any platform have to say the N word, whereas we would, in fact, I'm not going to say it because it would be, you know, grating in this context. But if I felt that I wanted to use the C word or the F word, the C bomb as it's used in yeah. comedy clubs, all anyone would think was I'd been rude. You know, they yeah. wouldn't think that it was a moral failing on my part. Yeah. You know, it has this particular status. And yet, as you say, any black comic, if you watch any clip on YouTube of a black comic performing live from Chris Rock right down to some guy in front of 30 or 40 people in a bar, they will use it like almost every fifth word. I mean, yeah. it's just such a such an, a repeated intensifier and it works as well. I mean, it, they just use it to mean bloke or mate, you yeah. know, and it's like, I can't even say it. This is an absurd, you know, situation we have where I could not actually repeat to you a Chris Rock routine now, yeah. word for word, without falling foul and people... And and the, and the the problem I think is that as soon as you try and discuss it, people will project onto you or assume that you are somebody who is straining at the leash, who is going red faced with their yeah. self containment, that they're fury at not being able to unleash this racial slur. Whereas in reality, in my entire life, at fifty seven years of age, I cannot remember ever using it. I mean, I cannot remember ever say ever using it in anger. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I cannot. It's never occurred to me. The only time I ever hear it in my head is when I see the N word written right. down in person. Just oh, that means you know. 
or I'm, I'm again watching. You know, I mean, and it is, it is crazy. And as you say, it, it, it of course connects with uh, a particularly, again, singular um, dehumanizing experience that black people experienced. You know, for for uh, what two hundred years or whatever in America, it's is of, of significant consequence to them. But that's not the universal experience. That was it was in in my in the seventies when I was growing up, the N word, if you ever heard it, really, was used by like a tiny handful of like national front supporters or whatever you might occasionally see a you know a a flyer or something or you know hear some people in 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 a pub you know speaking and you would always just seem to me so crude and sort of leaden you know it yeah. had it did not have it just implied that they had no intelligence really more than anything I else. I think I remember hearing it used by that kind of person as a pejorative term Maybe when somebody had had a drink, yeah. maybe a few times, perhaps in the early 80s mm. or the late 70s. I don't even remember. But you just, I, I just don't hear people using that word, you know, as a pejorative insult no, no. now. And the, y- P, the word that is referred to as the P word for which Jerry Sadovitz was censured in, in Edinburgh was vastly more uh, popular and weaponized in the 70s. Uh, as as in Pakistan, yeah, yeah, yeah. the uh, yeah, just an abbreviation of that, which you know, but again, again I always thought that was an abbreviation. I didn't realise it was. Well, a it's always term. it's always used but, as the intent, isn't it? But yeah. it was slightly dismissive. For instance, of a convenience store on the corner of a, a block, you know, would be referred to in those terms. And I wouldn't want to cause any Pakistani any offence by diminishing that. All in fact, if anything, I'm elevating. It. I'm saying that was the word which was used because that was the. Um, uh, that was the nature of the immigration, which yeah. people who were anti-immigration at the time were were most upset about, I think. And yet that doesn't have it, it seems to be, doesn't have anything like the same. I bet there are books being published every day which, which use that term. Yeah. You know, I mean, old, old, you know, I don't know, Kingsley Amos or whatever. So I, like, I have two mixed race kids, age yeah. 22 and 20, and they've grown up in South East London so they've grown up in, you know, a pretty mixed area and there's all that music that I can't bear, which I think is poison to the ears. But nevertheless, <laughs> they listen to it all the time. My daughter, especially all that grime and, mm. and drill and all that stuff yeah. where you repeatedly hear that word. Yeah. And you will have, you know, broadly and, and you have the sort of accent that South London accent is sort of a mixture of of Cockney and Jamaican and a bit of this and a bit of that. And it's a sort of amalgamation of all of them. And again, I don't, I think it's an ugly accent, but, but you know, they're part of all that thing. Intensely I, affected as well. I sometimes, mean, like on, you know, sometimes. Yeah. And, but so let's say, um, and you'll have, for example, you'll see a common example. You might see like a gang of say five or 10 kids and there might be, you know, Five black guys, three mixed race guys and two white guys. So you, that's the thing. And they're all part of that same mm. young South London culture. Now, do we have a situation where within that group, only the black guys, maybe the mixed race guys, but definitely not the white guys can use that word? Mm. Because if that's the case, it's a very... And you'll see, you know, you you see white guys who speak in that, yeah, whatever, you know, mm. that accent. Yeah, yeah. And to, to us, maybe you know, cranky old middle-aged white blokes, it looks fake, but it's probably the natural urban accent. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, y- no, you you're know, right, yeah. They pick it up from their peer group. That's, yeah. that's true. I mean, well, I mean, the obvious thing to say is it's a matter for them. I'm, I'm not going to yeah. attempt to impose rules or, or suggest how they might <laughs> want to negotiate or come to an arrangement. Um, but it must be difficult for them if they're all aspiring rappers. You know, yeah. if you're a, a, an aspiring white rapper and you have a, a limited, you know, argot that you can draw from compared to uh, your next door neighbour or even possibly your your brother within a, a blended marriage or whatever yeah. family, is, as, as people refer to it. You know, it's it's. I mean, it's just unsustainable. Like a lot of things in the modern world that we're supposed to accept that uh, are a, a common sense solution, such as you know, trans women being allowed to be in the WI but not being allowed to compete in boxing you know 
they fall apart under any scrutiny. You just say, well, you, you are creating nonsense here. You are creating artificial divisions. But whether or not, if kids feel that there is some... I mean, Sean Locke, bless his heart, you know, used to have a great bit of material about um, being a stand-up comic in Edinburgh and there being things about Edinburgh he'd like to tell jokes about, but he always felt they were jokes for the Scots to tell jokes about. And if he, uh, if he was to do them as an Englishman, it would be a bit like you can do a joke about your own dad, but if somebody else starts taking the piss out of your dad, then you get angry with them. You know, there is that kind of... I understand there is a sort of internal, external, you know, it's... It's it's a slight difference from with what the vocabulary you can have access to is to to what is the you know the level of criticism or the level of observation you might have about what, for instance, is underlying you know crime statistics or whatever. These are these are you know everything sort of shades into the next conversation. Yeah. So uh, there's a there's a taste call as well as a yeah. It's my right to say this. The comic has to exercise taste as well. I think so, and I would say you know rappers do as well. But it it yeah. does seem extraordinary to me that uh, as you you say there is a um, that there is you know there is a culture which is supposedly um, glorifying or celebrating a certain kind of street culture and yet still has kind of like Byzantine speech codes within it that that are as uh, as crazy as any you would have got in a you know a 15th century Spanish court or something mm. you know about who can say what so it was Alfie what's his name uh um, not Joan Rivers Moore Jan J- Jan uh, Raven's son J- yeah. Alfie Moore who I don't know if his career has been ended, but he's been majorly cancelled. Mm. Was it repeated use of the N word by him that got him? Yeah, he was using it. I think it, the routine think was some years ago, but he it was. But wasn't he doing it? He was trying to stretch boundaries, yeah. and he which was is what being, the comic should do. He was in being a way. provocative by using the word, mentioning it rather than using it, of course, okay. but saying that he was talking about how the impact of. I mean, I'm, I'll be right up front, I hadn't really seen him before and this was the first clip I saw and I thought it was, you know, not great. I thought it was OK. But it was basically about how if you want your swear words to have impact, they have to have hard, ideally fricative consonants, which, you know, uh, clatter against the eardrum with, with aggressive intent. You can't have too many swear words that just are um, mms and, or okay, even s's, you know. Sound engineer once said to me on those lines... Carrot is funny. Yeah. Potato isn't funny. Well, it's true. They say the funny letters are K, in yeah. fact, because even more than C, though, why that should be. But if you if it creates a K in your head, yeah. No, that's right. Peas are funny as well, though. I think potato, potato is OK, but not great for microphones. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him, Alfie Moore. I saw a show he did in Edinburgh maybe five or six or seven years ago. It was one of those sort of afternoon shows that I stumbled into. Mm. And he, he, I think he was trying new material. It was a new work in progress show. And it struck me that he was very composed mm. and he was quite funny with the audience, but he was trying to push boundaries. He yeah, was quite yeah. edgy, which is kind of what you want in a comic. But but I was the thing that struck me most was his poise and confidence. He did a great bit, which is also on, on video on YouTube, I think you can see, in which he essentially says what a lot of people have said in private, at least about Greta Thunberg, that she is quite happy to castigate Western governments, European and, and American, but is uh, looking the other way about the fact that eight out of the ten most polluting and and uh, particularly plastics in the oceans and so on, uh, worst polluting cities are in Asia, and and she won't address them at all. And um and she and he said and people call her brave. She's not brave. Do you know who's brave? I'm brave for telling you that. And it's it's funny because he twists it nicely. It's yeah. like it's kind of he's making an important point and he's also a bit self-deprecating because he's he knows that he's not being brave because he's doing it in a comedy club and, but. He talks about how they've weaponized an autistic 15-year-old girl in order to advance an agenda so that she is capable of delivering unwelcome but also, you know, uh, considerably vulnerable messages which should be subject to scrutiny. And instead, as soon as you complain, you're bullying a child, despite the fact that she's a child with a, an extraordinary worldwide platform. So he, he went there, you know, and that yeah. is somewhere where comedians should be going. And yeah. very, very far too few did go there. Yes. And also that a lot of by going there, that will have made him heretical to a certain That's group. Exactly. Of... Well, the thing that made him heretical to the certain group was he was anti-Corbyn and he accused Corbyn of anti-Semitism. And that's what attracted the attention of a certain number of activists who then dug out the uh, N-word clip and used that in order to undermine his uh, legitimacy and, and have him cancelled from various venues. But it was unmistakably his attack on Corbyn and momentum as being an, an anti-Semitic movement which attracted their attention. There's a, a particular Twitter account which made no bones about that being his his. Beef. Okay. 
So I brought up Alfie Moore and the N word for a reason because it mm. brings us back to, if you like, the mistake that Alfie made. Yeah. Brings us back to a great Woodhouse quote, um, which is this: "It is a good rule in life never to apologise. The right sort of people." do not want apologies, and the wrong sort take a mean advantage of them. Mm. And that's kind of what happened to Alfie, isn't it? I think it's. Uh, I think that is a timeless rule. It is what happened to Alfie. I don't know where he's at right now, but certainly as soon as he gave them the, the purchase, it is absolutely true. You show a bit of flank. when you People think of apologies as drawing a line under something, but it isn't. It's actually unstrapping your armour. And, um, and, and it's very, very dangerous online in particular, because if, if I was with you and I said something now... Um, that was uh, poorly thought through and and, uh, and you and I could see you taking offence and I would say sorry and you would accept my apology, we'd move on. Yeah. But an apology online is not like that. It's not remotely like that. It's it's absolutely... A, it's a, an admission. It's an admission of guilt and of failure and of weakness, of vulnerability. And if a thousand people see it and 999 accept the apology and the other one doesn't, then it's it, you're into into a world of pain, mm. and um, yeah, never apologise, never explain. Funnily enough, the very first words I said on stage at my open mic uh, performance in Edinburgh in 1997, which I regard as the beginning of my professional career. <laughs> <laughs> never apologise, never explain. Never apologise, never explain. That's what my granddad used to say, and that's as much as I'm going to say about this particular jacket and boot combination. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd gone up to Edinburgh without um, a fully packed suitcase, not re remembering that I was going to be on stage because I was mainly working up there as a sort of uh, pundit at the time for, for various things. And um, and so I'd had to buy clothes in a second-hand shop in order to go on stage. <laughs> but it's a good motto. OK, so your, so your objection to the uh, changing of the wording yeah. is we talked before the interview, we talked about the slippery slope. Yeah. Your objection is that it opens the door to other changes. I must say, I thought after the Dahl episode that they wouldn't do this, mm. but they've, they've gone there. Um, so let's talk about that. Well, I mean, it, there's an old saying, which I think actually comes from rather less acceptable uh, origin, but that, you know, if you put a drop of sewage into a vat of wine, you have a vat of sewage. And I know this will be seen as, as completely the other way around by some people. They're removing a drop of sewage from what is otherwise a vat of wine yeah. and thus restoring it to its delicious wine-like quality. And I totally understand and, and accept that their, that their intent is of that kind. But it is... It's always it always ratchets. It always ratchets. This stuff always escalates. It, it's it never stays there. Once you've opened the book once and taken out your correcting pen and struck out a single offensive term, the temptation to go back a second time and I think we might just be a little bit easier on the aunts. Wasn't that slightly misogynist? The uh, the attitude Woodhouse had towards aunts as being incorrigible old battle axes and calling to one another like mastodons across the swamp. Is it possible that we might scrutinise the source of Bertie's apparently inexhaustible funds? Is it not possible that some of those were tainted by colonial enterprise that might not be acceptable to modern ears? Is it possible that uh, Lord Emsworth and his scotophobic uh, attitudes <laughs> to the uh, the uh, the groundsman or whatever his name is, I can't remember his name. Prejudiced but the one, Scottish yeah, independence. It's never never too difficult to Angus, distinguish a, yeah. a Scotsman with a grievance from a ray of sunshine. I mean, yeah. all of these things are just joyous and funny uh, to us now, but... You know, I don't think it's implausible to... And then you start looking elsewhere and you start thinking, look at Graham Greene, for instance, in which uh, women are often described in, in terms that are quite abrasive now. If you read Brighton Rock, you know, you see... And, of course, it's through characters, but still, was he intending to be quite as as nakedly misogynist as, as he comes across now? Or would it be possible, for instance, to revisit Shakespeare and look at some of the, I mean, it, some of the, the richness and, and variety, the diversity of slurs and slanders which mm. his various characters come out with? Several of those now are quite shocking. Yeah, fortunately, nobody can understand yes, that that's he's right. been saved by incomprehensibility. <laughs> that's why you have to laugh loudly in the yeah. theatre if you have got it. You yeah, have to tell everyone how clever you are. So... But there are people like my eldest daughter, for example, would would agree with the censorship of of Woodhouse. She would oh. say it's a good thing, and um, and then when you start citing Graham Greene and whoever it is, Joseph Conrad, mm. uh, Rudyard Kipling, Irving whoever Welsh. it is, 
she wouldn't care because no. she hasn't studied most of those people. She might have read one or two of their books, but they don't occupy a status in her mind. And I'm 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 using my daughter as an example because she will be one of many in this new movement mm. that don't have the same these relics these are relics they're not sort of shrines of of mm. uh, greatness that perhaps you and me see them as no and that's absolutely fair and i i am actually not opposed to penguin i mean some people will say this is the case because i think there is an everyman edition of woodhouse which is a different publisher where they are um they, the text is intact so if you want the original text you can get it okay you know, as indeed there's a publisher of conrad tales who you know um is quite proudly boasts that there's Uncensored you know, exactly, woodhouse yeah that's right <laughs> I mean, it's it's fair. It's I I am absolutely I do understand all this. It, it uh, if they have parallel editions available and you can choose whether or not you want one that's been polished up a little bit, I'm sure there are probably already people who would like to see Rowling, uh, you know, revisited and so on, uh, or indeed just completely barred, of course. The it, difference is Woodhouse. I think if Woodhouse died in in seventy one, yeah, his stuff would have come out, come out of copyright in twenty twenty one. I yes. think so. Maybe it's... I don't know exactly how the rules work, but clearly his estate are still having some um, oh, a functional actually, relationship. I think it's so seventy five years. Seventy five years. Yeah, yeah. I think they're okay for a while. The um, I mean, one comparison is obviously with Shakespeare or with mm. with plays, which are always cut to some extent when they're put on. If you put on a production of Henry V. Um, that can vary from just removing one scene, which never made much sense in the first place, to casting Henry V as a woman, you know, or, yeah. or, or, or indeed black. And yeah, and you will, like Shakespeare gets edited like mad, all the just time. to make it work. Yeah, you absolutely. You know, to, you cut that scene, that's a that's a redundant scene, and yeah. it just, we need to speed and up the action And we know here. for a fact that the folio was largely constructed from a sort of consensus of hearsay from actors who had played the various parts, okay. and there were some scripts were extant, but others of them, they had to remember the speech mm -hmm. and were written down. I mean, there is clearly, there's been an opportunity for an awful lot of, of code to mutate yeah. over the years. But that's how to understand Shakespeare, of course, as well, despite the fact that at its best, it's it's matchless poetry it's also really a set of instructions for putting on a play mm -hmm. the play that you finally complete is a little bit like ikea furniture you know you might try and follow the instructions very closely or you might think actually i want that shelf to be a little bit, a little bit higher mm -hmm. you know uh, and the bizarre thing is that despite the fact that he, he deserves his reputation as the greatest writer of the century he's also the most available to reinterpretation yeah Novels are not quite like that, in my view, you know. No, um, because once they go to print and they're there, yeah. they're, yeah. Yeah. They're I mean, there. it's there for the writer to revisit. I can't remember if it was Larkin or somebody else said that a poem is never really finished, it's simply abandoned. You know, there is a point <laughs> at which you just can't, you, yeah. you tinker with it endlessly. But, I mean... My publisher Leonard used Cohen. to say that about books. He said, at a certain point, you just have to stop. You have to stop, and that's what an editor is for, of course. Leonard yeah. Cohen, that's why we, most of us, you know, I live to deadlines. I can write 3,000 words a week easily if I'm on deadline, but have I written a book in the last 25 years? No, because I can't work to that deadline. You know, three months hence, I need to have written 100,000 words. It's exactly the same mm -hmm. responsibility, but it, it just doesn't seem to fall that way. But, I, I mean, Leonard Cohen uh, famously revisited the lyrics to Hallelujah countless times. There are almost, um, I think, a dozen arguably valid you know, versions of that song that you could choose to select your verses from and so on. Yeah. You know, these are all slightly different, you know... They um, are, because, cases. like, let's say you were doing an old stand-up routine mm. and you were doing, like, the best of Simon Evans show. Yeah. Well, I know this when I go back and do old songs and I have to go and do them. I change the words. I change yeah. bits. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's, that's not going to work anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And it might right. be just because it wasn't that good a joke or... But it might just be because tastes have changed. Well, I've had, I was thinking about this the other day. This is because I'm trying to write an Edinburgh show at the moment and I know what will happen. I very often start when I'm writing a new show. I, I, I used to have a routine that remained a sort of signature routine to some extent about the Welsh. And it would begin with a joke, which you've probably heard me tell about the three men at the maternity yeah. ward in the hospital and one of them's Welsh. There was other material about the Welsh as well, about regarding um, access on the Severn Bridge, paying the toll as being like access to a theme park. And, you know, quite disparaging and, and um, arguably even, you know, you, I could understand why it was abrasive uh, to some people. Presumably but, you've got some Welsh in you. With the well, name, I haven't. used to assume I had Welsh in me, but that's another story, of yeah, course. But yes, okay. the Yevon surname, I thought, gave me a bit of a pass. But here's the interesting thing, I think, to me. 
I initially wrote that routine, I was trying to write something that would explore the reason why the, it still did seem to be OK to take the piss out of the Welsh and gingers, which at that time it was, maybe 2007, something like that, when almost all other forms of racism were becoming very problematic. We still, as the English, felt that it was OK to attack the Welsh, it, almost as though it were genetic. And, and yeah. the joke that I told seemed to encapsulate that and make that point. So it was kind of, I'm getting the, of course, like all comedians, you try and have it both ways. You try and get the laugh and then people go, uh, yeah. I, you know, you were happy to laugh at that, but you wouldn't have been happy if it had been this, would yeah. you, or whatever, you know. But like all comedians, you listen to how your material goes down. You respond to some extent to the audience. They like this, they didn't like that. And before you know it, a year later, sometimes the apparent subtext to your routine can have changed entirely. You know, mm. and you're not quite saying what you thought you were yeah. wanting to say at all. Particularly if you're not doing the routine all the time. Yeah. And you, you just remember the, the punchline yeah. without that. And so it changes and it mm -hmm. evolves. And I don't know whether one should, as a comedian, take one's responsibility for being committed to the message, but I don't think my... I, I very rarely think I have an important message. I'm just there to tickle, you know, and, yeah. and to amuse. And, um, I mean, I would certainly stop short of... of um, you take us on an intellectual journey, Simon. Yeah, A, a culture, what a cultured man. But it's like a wander down past the Bayer tapestry, isn't it? And you, you spot some oddities. But it's it's not our <laughs> job. It's not my our job. It's like a wander down yeah. Bayer tapestry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not our job to, to hector and cajole and, and lecture. I don't believe that, you know. I think if you can make people think, it's usually because they they notice some of the inconsistencies in their own responses, but you, you, you're you not there to sort of start. That's not it what depends on the type of comedian for. you are, but broadly yeah. speaking, I would agree, and that certainly was not what Woodhouse felt his, his no, role. No, exactly. Um, red hair, sir, in my opinion, is <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> was that jeans? That's a wood, yeah. <laughs> yes. um, so coming back to uh, Woodhouse, well, actually, I want to come back to this subject of the slippery slope because we've got about 10 more minutes. And mm. at, 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 when we were having lunch before this interview, you were talking about, um, you, you used the analogy of the euthanasia argument and the yeah. slippery slope. So why don't we just talk about that for a, for a couple of minutes? Assisted suicide. There was a debate which um, I haven't seen the whole debate, but but uh, one transcript from one of the uh, speakers was was up on put on Twitter. Very interesting. And he was speaking. He said, you know, that you can understand the appeal of assisted suicide for people in the last few days, weeks or months, perhaps even of a long life. But they have now entered a period of intense and unrelenting pain where even the best palliative care cannot relieve their misery for one moment and that they are in good conscience and of sound mind. Uh, they wish to have this misery ended. They want to stop being, a, you know, their own life and the burden that they present to their loved ones or whatever. Who could possibly want to deny them? And yet in every nation, in every legislature which has introduced the the prospect of assisted suicide in those particular cases, it has very swiftly enlarged and the criteria for making it available have started to be people for who, for instance, are uh, offered assisted suicide as an alternative because they fail to get the wheelchair access to their flat that they've requested. Has that happened? That has happened. I can't remember if it was Canada or the Netherlands, which were the two countries he gave Does examples Does this kind of thing of. happen in Switzerland? I think, funnily enough, Switzerland, where it remains, of course, an extraordinary profit centre, you know, it's, yeah. um, it's uh, nevertheless remains fairly well uh, governed. You know, the oversight is, I think, still probably what we would accept. But yeah, some that, of the does, stories, that is the problem is people some of the marketing stories euthanasia had, for profit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but some of these stories he had from the Netherlands were so shocking. I, I couldn't believe it. And this and is so close neighboured. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, there are very few countries which map onto ours in terms of the history of legislation and the general sort of and mindset. culture and Exactly. And, and if, it, if, and if it could happen there, language. it could happen here. I always think the Netherlands accent sounds Cockney when you hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Any sorry. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, well, our our last, I mean, the, 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 um, the, what's the word, the refutation that people always bring up when we say we haven't been invaded since 1066. Well, of course we were, but it was done so smoothly by the Dutch that yeah. um, that it was accepted as... Uh, 1687? That's right, yeah. I say, mm. right, it was certainly that decade anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, I think we probably all benefited from it. It was probably one of the great Brixen. examples of a pragmatic attitude, you know, yeah. because it was completely insupportable um, in, in terms of the... Uh, 
you know, the, the, the line of mm-hmm. succession and so on, it was it was a fix, you know, but very much like the, the Good Friday Agreement, it was one of those fixes that just worked. You know? <laughs> anyway, it would be, you know, obviously facetious to draw a comparison between assisted suicide and, and, and Woodhouse in a way, but it is an example of how once you start something, you just think, well, why not that? And if not that, why, then why not this as well? And if we've got those in, well, why not this? And it always angers me when the slippery slope is, is denounced as some sort of uh, fallacy because it's so evidently in front of our eyes everywhere. You know, you see things every single day that would have been unthinkable 10 years ago but that have been advanced very slowly and cautiously with a repeated number of feet and a repeated number of doors until we're completely defenceless against the next iteration of something that's absolutely yeah. absurd. Well, a lot of people would say immigration being the most obvious example. Yeah, I mean, well, there you would open a whole new can of worms at the, in the last well, three minutes not, of the interview. Not, <laughs> not where I want to go. Um, but I'll, I'll give you the most, perhaps one of the greatest examples of that, um, would be the National Insurance Act of David Lloyd George and Winston Churchill, yeah. 1911. Basically, a ty- the friendly societies were so successful, but only for 95% of the police population. Lloyd George and Churchill wanted to replicate that at a national level. But in doing so, they put the friendly societies out of business. Yeah. And basically, that was the beginning of the large state yeah. in the UK. And it was just that little bit and of you little bit of sewage in there about that i mean those your books are the um uh, daylight robbery and, and life after the state of, were, were really eye uh, opening to me on that and the, the great quote from ajp taylor of course in his uh, 1914 to 45 book is yeah. i think that that before the first world war uh, uh, basically to paraphrase it, uh, an ordinary decent citizen could go about his business from from cradle to grave without ever really being aware of the state and barely notice the existence of yeah. the state by the policeman and the post office yeah yeah was extraordinary the gives you little shivers doesn't it yeah it's a, it's a great quote but on the other hand I, I'm, I'm opening up cans of worms which i don't mean to do but on the on the one hand we are less free than we were mm. but because of technology yeah in many ways we're more free in the sense that we're more empowered we can travel further we can travel quicker we've got our phones blah blah yeah. blah so it's it's not quite as as idyllic 1910 no, as we no, might like to think. No, absolutely not. And it, I mean that is a really interesting conversation for another time, or perhaps with another guest. But disentangling technological progress from what passes for progress politically, sociologically, mm. and so on is a really interesting. I mean, I'm sure people have written about it and thought about it in more detail than I'm capable of. But it seems to me that an awful lot of what we um, you know, of what people who uh, are in favour of the modern world essentially will sort of roll their eyes when you when you have any kind of nostalgic leanings or, or a preference for previous, you know. And, you, you know, no, I don't want to go back to rickets. I don't want to go back to dying of tetanus because I cut my mm. finger on some rusty uh, chain link fencing. But those aren't... Uh, those aren't like an artifact of the state. That's an artifact of, of um, technological innovation, which was almost always made independent. Independently, yeah. Matt Ridley, How Innovation Works, really excellent yeah. book on that. A great man and a listener to this show. Hello, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just to conclude, coming back to this subject of 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 the N word and so on, and Woodhouse and. I think you have to, like for me, racism is the persecution of another race uh, uh, on the grounds of race or colour. The persecution mm. of a person on the grounds of race or colour. And you have to judge a comment that might be deemed racist, but actually you have to judge it by the intent. Mm. And so... You know, an old man might use a, an outdated terminology because tastes have changed and so on. And he didn't mean it with any ill intent. He just said the word in the way that he knew. And so you, I just think the word, the intent is is crucial, well, especially when you're differentiating between speech and violence, which people seem incapable of doing. The obvious example of that, um, which I, I remember some years ago coming home from university, having been first exposed to sort of, you know, new liberal speech mm. codes and so on, and hearing my mother refer to coloured people mm-hmm. and feeling a shudder of shame, you know, uh, on her behalf. And then thinking afterwards, so coloured people is wrong. And then the and this was before the new term people of color yeah. had come in, and people of color came in and became the acceptable term. And I was thinking, you have to be capable of some really quite extraordinary 
mental gymnastics to discern a significant difference between coloured people and people of colour. I understand the historical associations, and of course in yeah. South Africa, coloured people meant something very specific. Yeah, so my dad used to give well, me a, you know, a rollicking yeah. when I said coloured people. Yeah. He, he, was, he was really... What a white but it's people the have most no people of color is the most degrading, condescending term imaginable. To suggest that if, like a Vietnamese person, a, an authentic descendant of slavery, and a, a Chinese diplomat all have something in common simply by virtue of not being originally of North European stock is just—I can't imagine a more vivid example of. Of of it's not, not even racism. It's like it's like it's it's not even in, it's worse than racism yeah. somehow. You know, it's done to garner status. But yeah. But anyway, and I, I remember watching a football match once upon a time, and it was Holland was playing somebody, and Mark Lawrenson was the pundit, and you know, Lawrence Loro's Loro's probably a bit, you know, he's an old boy, and his his he would have used the wrong terminology. Yeah. And he was he was talking favourably about the Dutch team. He was saying, I really love the way they play and how, you know, they've got these players they can play in any position and it was in the days of Ajax totally football. Yeah. And then Lawrenson went, I'm never forget him saying, I mean, yeah, the Dutch were they got then two coloured lads at the back. And he was praising them. And they were they were two mixed race gut players, yeah. Reisinger and I forget who the other one was. And he was praising them and there was just this awkward mm. pause on the air and you just knew <laughs> Lawrence would give the most almighty <laughs> <laughs> the shepherd's yeah. crook, but he coming. meant no malice by it. No, he just used the wrong, the un, out of turn. I mean, that's that is another thing, isn't it? Of course, having people who are speaking in the present day, but from a, uh, but for having had their sensibilities set, you know, earlier and finding mm -hmm. it harder to adjust constantly. And um, I mean, they're all subtly different issues from Woodhouse or Shakespeare or, um, or or Conrad or all the rest of it. But there is definitely that, and I think there is. There are, without question, there is an industry now, it has been weaponised, there are people for whom it's important that race remain as inflammatory an issue as mm -hmm. possible, because it is then used to build coalitions, yeah, it's it's used in order to build what, what is not actually a very intelligent coalition at all. I don't know whether you saw the uh, these figures the other day, but... Um, they were published, uh, I think, from the Federal Reserve in America. Anyway, certainly some sort of copper-bottomed institute on the amount of wealth uh, accrued by millennials in America. And by far and away, the wealthiest millennials are of Asian origin. They have something like, on average, yeah. median figure of around three hundred k dollars. Whites were at about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and blacks were at the bottom with something like nine thousand dollars. To use a term people of colour, which would include black people at the bottom with less than $10,000 to their name and Asians at the top with more than twice what the average white has, just exposes the... It's, I mean, it's just... F the one that gets me like that is nuts. The one that gets yeah. me like is calling people Asian. Yeah. Because, I mean, Asia is literally the biggest continent in the world. Absolutely. Are you talking about, you know, Filipinos and Japanese? Are you talking about Russians? Are you talking about Indians? Sri are you Lankans, talking about Arabs? You know, who Koreans. are you talking about? And, of course, some people would say Europeans. Yeah. You know, it's a peninsula on the end of Asia, essentially. It's, it's not really its own <laughs> landmass. Um, so we're, we're agreed on, 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 on intent. Um, Simon... I, I, want, I want to end because if ever, if, ever there, if there was <laughs> if ever there was an author who just was without malice, mm. if ever there was a man who was without malice, and you look, he he all he did was write, and he just created these worlds of innocence mm. and joy and just these happy places, even if they don't exist in our minds figuratively. You know, the Woodhousean world is probably the most you know if you think of Tolkien's world or Orwell's world mm. or all these great writers worlds Shakespeare's world the 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 Woodhousean world is probably the most gentle harmless idyllic lovely peaceful world and so I, in a way we're talking about intent um there was here's a a, a comment from Woodhouse that, that 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 demonstrates what he intended and as we grow older and realise more clearly the limitations of human happiness, we come to see the, that the only real and abiding pleasure in life is to give pleasure to other people. Mm. And that is all Woodhouse wanted to do. Absolutely. Bring pleasure and joy. And he and achieved laughter. it on a, a pretty much unexampled scale. I mean, I would say I've had one or two other comic authors in my lifetime who, if I'm honest, 
I was introduced to perhaps earlier and have meant more to me, probably Douglas Adams, the the, uh, the greatest for me. But he produced something like five percent of the of the you know of the of the size of the corpus, and he himself acknowledged Woodhouse as his as his great example and his his mentor. You know? I love Douglas Adams, but he never had the lightness. No, well. He had a, a more interesting mix, perhaps, because he was full of ideas as well. Yeah. But he was one of the few who could occasionally have that touch. Anyway, yeah. listen, I absolutely agree. It's like Ella Fitzgerald with uh, an orchestra arranged by Nelson Riddle. It's, you know, there are a hand, and as Douglas Adams said, Bach, Mozart, mm-hmm. Einstein and Louis Armstrong. You know, these are people who operate on a sort of higher stratosphere. It's play. They're, it's simply a play. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. I would strongly recommend anyone who has been um, bemused or baffled by the last hour to go and investigate it. Um, yeah. you've, I don't know anyone who's ever regretted an hour or two spent with Woodhouse. Uh, and and much, much more. Simon, thank you so much. As we close, um, why don't you tell me about any tours you're doing, any shows you're doing, Edinburgh, plug your Twitter. Sure. I'm, I'm still touring my show Work of the Devil until the end of June. Um, there are, I think, about a dozen or so dates remaining on that tour. That's been touring since before lockdown. So, um, you know, uh, that's been the longest uh, running thing I've ever had. I've got a new show in I've, Edinburgh. I've seen the show, by the way, and it is excellent. And just tell us, how can, where can we find out what the dates are? Well, if you come to my website, thesimonevans.com, okay. and you'll find everything there. And then I've got a new show in Edinburgh called Have We Met? Wonderful stuff. Simon Evans, thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. Pleasure. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Please subscribe uh, to the Flying Frisbee Substack. I have great ambitions for this channel and we are going places. Until next time, thank you very much. Goodbye.